Hello, I'm Greg Sadler, and welcome to another one of my Sadler's Honest Book Reviews, a series in which I look at books dealing with philosophy, life, leadership, organization, all sorts of practical matters. And the book that I'm looking at today is Unshakable Freedom, Ancient Stoic Secrets Applied to Modern Life by Chuck Chopracani, somebody who I actually know. This one actually bears, uh, in my case, uh, an inscription by the author because he gave it to me at Stoicon, where, where he was a speaker and I was one of the workshop providers. And um, it's a very interesting book. I think this is one that I, I do, in fact, recommend to... Um, people who are interested in Stoicism. Uh, there are a few things that I'll, I'll say about it towards the end where I think that you've, you've got to be a little bit careful. But on the whole, I think that this is actually a really solid work for somebody who wants a very bare bones approach to applying Stoic philosophy. You're not going to learn an awful lot about Stoic philosophy except for the parts that, that Chuck... Uh, thinks are directly actionable. But on, on the whole, a very interesting work, and I, I was glad to, to read it and to review it. So let's begin by talking about the style, the structure, and doing a little bit of a summary of the work. The style is is very conversational. If you've read much sort of inspirational or self-help or, you know, how to improve your, your life or your business kind of literature, then the format I think will be very familiar to you. Uh, very short chapters, uh, lots of examples, lots of, of, of discussions, and then quite a few techniques or, or practical exercises for a person to do. He's got the book structured, and it's not a very long book. It's a little over 160 it's about 165 pages total. Um, he's got it structured into five main sections. Um, part one, which is very short, choose freedom. Part two, be free, which is starting to get into the nuts and bolts. Uh, part three, review and explore. He's doing a bit of a deeper dive into discussing stoicism itself. Um, interestingly, he's not giving you a big introduction to that at the beginning. That's coming about halfway through the book. And then part four is called Workout in the Stoic Gym. Um, this is published by the Stoic Gym, which is Chuck Chopricani's um, website and, and business. And it, it, he's got a very clear goal in mind, which is to try to make Stoicism as simple as possible for people to apply in their their lives and then give them ways to practice. And then there's a, a reference section at the end, which may be useful for, for some readers. One of the things that I think is really good about the reference section is that he provides you with um, what he calls a reading plan, starts with some very basic things. And then there's an intermediate level and an on your own kind of level as well. So I think that that's, that's quite good. Um, you know, this, this did come out several years ago, so there are a number of other new books that, that probably, if this is released in a second edition, I think he'll probably include in those as well. So, you know, it's structured along that, that set of lines. Um, each section will have one or two big ideas being discussed. Like I mentioned, lots of long biographical examples. And then there's some, some practical, you know, techniques and some, some other things involved in, in it as well. So that's, that's really all I think there, that needs to be said about this. It's, I think it is set up very well for the um, reader who doesn't have a lot of time on their hands, but wants to get some actionable stuff that they can start digging into right away. So what are some of the key ideas that you would find interesting in this work? So it's called Unshakable Freedom, and I think that is, is a really important idea to start with. You know, we use this word freedom, and, and, you know, we need to clarify what we mean for ourselves about freedom. And Stoicism does, in fact, do that. Chuck uh, helps to, you know, call out some of the things that the Stoics thought about freedom and its relationship with, say, rationality or what's in our control. And what he's aiming for is indeed unshakable freedom, freedom that we can't have taken away from us 
Um, and I think that's an interesting thing to center the entire book around. So there's that. Um, he talks quite a bit about, you know, the dichotomy of control in Stoicism. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, there are some things under our control, some things that are not under our control, and we need to focus on the things that are in our control and not get worked up over the things that are outside of our control and be able to tell the difference between them, right? So that's important. And I, I, I really do like the emphasis on controlling what is in our control. Because sometimes people make the dichotomy and they're like, okay, so I got to let go of this stuff over here. But they forget about the, no, you, you actually are supposed to do stuff with what's in your control. Um, a lot of discussion of happiness as being connected with a rational life, a life of the virtues, the four stock virtues being, of course, uh, wisdom, temperance, justice, courage, um, and there, there is some discussion of what's in accordance with nature, but like a lot of contemporary Stoic authors, um, Chuck basically uh, follows the line of that just means living a rational life. Um, you know, the, the discussion about whatever is not under our control, I think, is, is quite good. And the Stoics use this word indifference in the plural, things that are indifferent. Uh, to describe them. So whatever is not under our total control is is really in the realm of indifference. Now, some of these could be preferred. Uh, that's the classic terminology or desirable is the terminology that Chuck is using. Uh, and he says that those are in our partial control, um, which I think is a little bit of a problem with the dichotomy of control, but I, I do see why he's saying that. He also has a, a, some great discussions about enjoying what is actually offered to us without getting ourselves entangled with those things or encumbered by them. And then, you know, one of the really strong points about the book is, is the entire set of techniques that he has in here. So the idea is that if we want to control what is in our control um, and, and be able to, to extricate ourselves from the things that are outside of our control, at least emotionally, or in terms of cognition, you know, thinking that things uh, are the way that they are, um, we need to apply certain techniques which are going to change our, our mindset and ultimately lead us to this unshakable freedom. I would say that is really the core of the ideas in the book. Now, what did I particularly like about the book? I'm smiling because I'm thinking, in addition to the fact that I had the author himself hand me a copy, signed copy, which I always like. By the way, little plug, if you, if you want me to review your book, eh, send me a copy, right? And, and I'll, I'll certainly consider it. Um, I, I think, like I said, this for beginners, for somebody who wants to get into Stoicism and doesn't want to be you know, uh, reading the Enchiridion or the, the meditations, but, but plans to do that eventually, this is a great entry point. Um, you know, it's written in a very accessible way. Um, I think that um, this, this is probably one of, one of the better contemporary books that's out there for what it's attempting to do. Um, Chuck is, is, is extremely clear on the fact that he thinks he said this, you know, in person and in many other places that stoicism can be made quite simple. I, I don't actually agree about that. I think that it's better described as sort of a, a complex system um, or, or a network of, of different ideas that, that in fact inform each other. But I, I do see the validity for beginners for, for doing what he's, he's doing. Uh, it's got a lot of great actionable stuff that, that you can start doing almost immediately. It's, it's, it's very well structured, I would say, in the way that he's put it together. There's one part um, that I particularly liked. I had to mark it in here um, because there's, there's a lot of what we can call, let's compare stoicism to everything else going on out there. And, and he, he deliberately says stoicism and the serenity prayer um, not exactly the same thing. He says, and this is on page 33, the goal of the Stoics was the achievement of total freedom, not conditional freedom. For this reason, they did not leave something outside the dichotomy and ask God for the wisdom to know the difference between what they could change and what they could not. Stoics defined it. So I, I think that's, that's actually a nice uh, way to, to frame it. Um, 
there's lots of really inspiring and, and I would say substantive examples. It's one thing when you give an example and you throw it out there and you're like, this person has some vague connection with stoicism. Um, it's another thing when you say, here's what they did. Here's the parts that may not be stoic. Here's the parts that actually are stoic, whether they realized it or not. And here's the payoff for them. And, and there's quite a few examples like that in here. So I think that's really quite good. And, um, you know, the techniques that, that Chuck is providing in here are not, you know, radically new. You wouldn't expect them to be if they're actually stoic, right? Um, but they're, they're really well laid out, you know. So for each of the techniques, he's got a, a name that you can use to, to remember it, when to use it, what to use it for, how does it actually work. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's quite, quite good. Um, some of them... You know, I, I, I'm not sure I completely uh, agree with like the Marcus 9, but, but all the rest are, are, are quite good um, and, and very useful, I, I think. So that is what I like about the work. I think with any work of this sort that's attempting to be very simple and very popular, there's some things that are going to creep in where, you know, if, if you're approaching it as like I am, somebody who who studies Stoicism and teaches about it, you're going to say, eh, I'm not quite sure about that. So there, there's, there's some of these aspects of that in this book. Uh, on page 15, for example, he says that philosophers uh, back in the ancient period were self-help gurus, the original life hackers, and he gives you a list, you know, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Buddha, Zeno, Diogenes, Epicurus, Epictetus, were uh, concerned about the human condition and how to achieve freedom and happiness. That last sentence, that's quite true. But they weren't all life hackers. That that's totally you know life hacking is 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 kind of you know doing stoicism or doing epicureanism light, not actually doing the thing itself. And you can say the same thing about people applying Confucianism or Buddhism or or uh, uh, Taoism. So I think that that is a bit mis, mis, a bit of a mischaracterization there. Um, in uh, a little bit later on, there's there's another point that I wanted to, to pick up on, um, and this has to do with, with um, talking about, I mentioned there's a lot of examples being used, and when, when Chuck Chopricani spells out the examples, they're quite good, but it's become kind of a talking point. He says, you know, Stoicism inspired people like Frederick the Great, Benjamin Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt, Bill Clinton, you know, um, he, he claims that it, it influenced thinkers like John Stuart Mill. I, I don't, I don't, I think that the, the connection between these people and stoicism is so tenuous that we're just name dropping basically to try to get people on board. And I, I don't think that that's needed. Um, then, you know, on, on page 34, he says that there's really only three things under our control. Um, desires, attraction or aversion, Right judgments for or against, which, which would be similar to, I think, what, what traditionally have been called a sense, although the judgment is a term that's used, and then movements towards or away. And I see what he's doing there. He's, he's actually trying to talk about the three disciplines. That's not all that, that Epictetus thinks is under our control. Epictetus thinks that the uses of things that are outside of our control is in our control. He thinks that um, plenty of other things are actually in our control. So this is misleading. That, that's a problem there. I think. Um, then on, on uh, page 44, you know, talking about the freedom thing, <clears throat> there is this, this notion that, like, you know, we're completely free when it comes to things that are in our control. Um, and Epictetus uh, and also the other Stoics are totally clear on this point that habit um, is, is something that is, in a certain sense, in our control, but it also does hinder us. So when he's saying Stoics point out that the past cannot hinder you, your past is over. Uh, no, habit is part of what tr brings the past into the present. So that's a problem, too. Now, notice that in the book, all of these techniques um, are bearing upon the realm of, of habit because you do them over, over time. Um, I think that in, uh, there's, there's a bit of an inconsistency as well um, in the discussion about, um, where was it, uh, passion. Um, yeah, the passion counter technique, 
Uh, the idea, which is kind of a really, I actually like this idea, carry a pocket counter, one of those things you can click. And um, whenever you, he says, whenever you feel anger coming on, click the counter. And then before going to sleep, gently review how many times your passion got the better of you. So this is not, this is just a, a, a quibble. I think that it's easy to confuse um, the passion getting the better of you with, with feeling the, the emotion of anger. And you want to be able to distinguish between the two of them. So I, I think I probably would have would have mentioned that in there. But it's very easy to, you know, Monday morning quarterback these sort of things, right? There's a chart on page 107, um, which is you know, kind of a cool thing. But I think it's actually a bit off in that he says that in the realm of what, what the Stoics viewed as total indifference, um, he... Th- places in there things like the death of a loved one stoics did not view that as a total indifferent they viewed total indifference as like the number of hairs on your head that's something that's totally indifferent death of a loved one is definitely a dispreferred indifferent right um uh an accident is another example so so that's there's a problem there, a minor problem, right? The chart is for the most part right, but th- there's stuff that, that should have been placed in there. And then um, the history that he's telling, um, you know, about the, the development of the Stoic school, that's eh, a little problematic in, in ways that, that I, I see often um, coming up. Um, you know, people, people do this, this, this sort of thing when they're, when they're, when they're telling you about how the Stoics develop. He does the, the same thing that a lot of people do, which is to say Diogenes is the, the starter of the, the Cynic school. Scholars disagree. Um, Diogenes Laertes attributes it to Antisthenes. I think that's probably well attested. So, you know, that, that's kind of, kind of an issue, I think. Um, there's a few other kind of minor points as well. Um, let me see if I can find this. This right ah, here we go. Where did Stoicism come from? Um, it, it's not that the only forerunner of Stoicism was Cynicism. Zeno also studied with with the Platonic school and with the Megarian school. Um, that may be a little bit of a, a quibble. Um, when when he's talking about the Middle Stoa. He says that Cicero wrote a book re-expressing Stoic arguments. Cicero wrote a number of books re-expressing Stoic arguments, so I'm not sure which single book he's referring to. Could be On Duties, could be Stoic Paradoxes, could be on The Fragmentary On Fate, could be The Tusculan Disputations, could be On Ends. You see where I'm going with this. That Cicero was actually writing quite a bit. So I, I wouldn't rely on the history, but it's only three pages. It's very short. And if you want to know your Stoic history, I mean, you can, you can easily go to many other resources for that. So those are my, the things that I found problematic about the book. All right. So my, my final thoughts, I, I give the book a recommendation. I give it a recommendation for two groups of people, people who want to know a bit about stoicism and want to be able to apply it right away. I think this is a wonderful book for that. I think that, that this, this will help a lot of people. This is sort of a gateway book. You want to read this so that you then will start reading Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus or Seneca or, or Cicero, whoever. Um, I think that it is a good for somebody like me. It's always nice to get reminders and, and see how other people are, are sort of, you know, refiguring things, particularly when it comes to the techniques. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of happy about, about that as well. Um, so I, I think that this could be a, a good book. This nice, you know, reading selection um, for contemporary Stoic conceptions of things definitely fits into the modern Stoic movement. So if you fit into those sort of classes of readers, I would say get this book.